Hi everyone, Dom Famularo again back here for the Sessions Panel Artist Series at Odysseus. In my life, the influence of hearing Gary Lewis and the Playboys perform was so great to hear another drummer leading a band. Would you all please welcome Gary Lewis. Gary, thank you so much for joining me. Uh, thanks for having me. You know, Gary, as a young kid, you know, the influence of the British invasion and back in 64, then 65, Gary Lewis and the Playboys, you guys were everywhere performing this diamond ring, all these songs that were so fun at that time, happy, fun songs. It just got us all wanting to play music. So I got to go back to, to the beginning stages. I mean, you play drums, you learn some guitar, you sing, you got heavily involved with the band of what it was. How did it start for you by getting kind of involved in music? I was going to a theater arts college in Pasadena, California. The way you get your grades is you do Greek tragedies on stage <laughs> and, you get, and you get graded by it. So I'm, I'm dancing around the stage in my leotards and tights. <laughs> and I said, no, no, this is, this is not going to work. Boom, the Beatles came out. And I said, that's exactly what I want to do. Because at the time, I already knew how to play clarinet and saxophone. And the drums also. We just started playing around Pasadena, sorority parties, fraternity parties, you know. And then we had a year to uh, build up a repertoire. And uh, we also played out at Disneyland for the summertime of 64, which kind of launched our career. Our producer, Snuffy Garrett, was out at the park with his family. And he came back to talk to me after our show and he said, I'm head of an A&R for Liberty Records. I'd like to talk to you about doing some recording. Now, isn't that the way everybody wishes it would happen? <laughs> that really is the fantasy dream come true. So you had this band with just some friends that got together because isn't that kind of how the, the name came about? You just kind of were hanging out with some friends and they kind of showed up late. And The original Playboys were classmates at that theater arts college. The bass player had a cabana out from his house where we could rehearse. So that was perfect too. Little gigs around Pasadena. So you were playing cover songs of different bands. Right, right. We, that's, that's what we did the entire time at Disneyland. We started recording in November 64. Disneyland was summertime of 64. So what we did was just play uh, everybody else's music that was in the top 40. That was no problem because that's what everybody did. Uh, even when we started recording, we like when we had Diamond Ring, we put Diamond Ring on the album and everybody else's hits. Well, what a different time it was years ago. Now, Snuff Garrett, tell me about him. What, what, what was he like? Well, I, I got to tell you, I mean, in his career, he never had any failures at all. Not only did he have the ability to pick hit songs, but he knew exactly when to put them out, too. Like if the Beatles came out with a new song, Snuffy would wait three weeks before he'd put ours out. <laughs> you know, he, he, he knew what to do, you know? Well, as they say, timing is everything. And he had a real feel for that naturally, which was he really was amazing. Good. He was really good, yeah. The band was not the original band members. You had to replace some members of the band? That began the entire Tulsa thing, Tulsa, Oklahoma thing of the musicians that were coming in, Carl Radel was uh, of the new bass player that we got. And along with him, we got Leon Russell to do all of our arranging. He was the arranger of everything we did. You know, he got with us to arrange this diamond ring. And that's actually the first time I heard of Leon. So this time, who, who wrote that song? Al Cooper. Al Cooper wrote it for the Drifters. And the Drifters said, no, we don't like it. <laughs> So then uh, Snuffy Garrett offered it to Bobby V, and Bobby V said, no, I don't like it. <laughs> so then he offered it to me. It, it could have been any song. You think <laughs> I'm going to say no? <laughs> Jeez. So we put a great arrangement to Diamond Ring, shot right to number one. You know, here we are acting like maniacs. We're so excited we can't see straight. We're, we're having trouble breathing and all that. And Snuffy says, you guys better calm down. Do you re realize how many one-hit artists there are in the world? And boy, he put our minds in the right place. Well, it's amazing to have that kind of guidance with someone like that. What do you think he saw in you guys as far as just the potential of this band? I think he liked the way we played together. We did all the basic tracks on everything we did. 
if we weren't good enough to do that, Leon and Snuffy would have said, wait a minute, we'll bring the guys in. Yeah. You know, but they, they were happy with the way we played. So I think that was the initial thing, that, that they liked the way we sounded together. Let's talk about your drumming now. I mean, did, did you take lessons? I mean, how did you develop that, that skill? When I was five years old, we were living in Los Angeles. We had just pretty much moved out there because my dad and Dean Martin were getting movie deals. This guy, this friend of my dad's, used to come over all the time and he'd say, hey, kid, let's go out to the drums. We had drums set up in this other part of the house. He said, come on out here. Let me show you some stuff. So that I'm only five, you know, and now he's teaching me things. And it wasn't until I was 12 years old that I found out this friend of my dad's was Buddy Rich. <laughs> Buddy Rich gave me 70 years of lessons. <laughs> Just when he would come over, you know? You know, I had the chance of meeting Buddy in 1971. I was 18 years old. I had a chance of meeting Buddy and getting to know him the last 16 years of his life. And he had such wonderful respect for your dad. I mean, and, and your dad also played drums. Yeah, he kind of. I always used to tell him, Dad, you rush. You rush. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's good to be on top of the beat, but don't rush. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that was just the level of entertainment excitement that he always had in his life. Right, right. And, and so Buddy Rich gave me a, a great foundation. So you got to realize, here you are getting lessons from the greatest drummer on the planet, Buddy Rich, who was performing at that time with his own band, with Frank Sinatra, you name it, Buddy was performing everywhere. And here he is coming by and sharing some deep insight with you at a young age. I, and I loved it. And he wasn't in a hurry either. You know, we'd be out there two, three hours sometimes, you know. And then my dad would, would say to me, are you done with Mr. Humble? <laughs> <laughs> the relationship that your dad and Buddy Rich had was, was, was an ongoing vaudeville act that was oh, just, but, yeah, it was fantastic. You're right. It was. You know, they had a drum off one time on one of my dad's TV shows. Uh, and it was hilarious. You know, Buddy would do some good, great thing. <laughs> and now, okay, Jerry, you take it. And it'd be all just sticks falling. And oh, it, was, it was great. Look so what good. was it like touring now? Now, here you're going out to touring. Now you wanted to come out and sing in front of the band. So, and you were playing guitar at that time also to come out and sing. So how did the band shift and the change with that? I didn't come off the drums until our fifth single. I, I played drums on Diamond Ring, Count Me In, Save Your Heart For Me, and Everybody Loves a Clown. Yeah. After that, I was getting real antsy having to sit behind the drums. I had too much energy. I wanted to bounce around. I wanted to see the people's faces. Yeah. I couldn't see anybody. Spotlights yeah. right in your eyes. Yeah. I saw nothing. So that's what I wanted to do. So that's when I hired Jim Keltner. At that time, Jim Kelter was out in L.A. You yep. hired him, he came into the band, he learned all the tunes and started going on tour with you guys. Jim Keltner, he would play jazz with the Don Randy trio, you know? Yeah. When he started with me, he had to go from the seven A's to the two B's. Oh, interesting. You know, the logs, you know? And man, <laughs> I, I turned around one time to see how he was doing and, and blood was just coming down his arms. <laughs> uh, he, he, say, he says, don't worry about me. I'll get used to it. <laughs> Jim is a real trooper. He's a phenomenal person and just an yeah. incredible crowd musician. He even says himself was really kind of a dedicated jazz player. He was yeah. really, he was a, a real you know, jazz enthusiast and adapted to getting involved in rock the way he eventually did. It constantly amazes me how these jazz guys can all go off in their own direction, but all come in on one perfectly. <laughs> and and I, I asked this one friend of mine, how do you do that? He says, man, you got to live it. <laughs> you got to live it? <laughs> what the hell is that mean? <laughs> it's kind of interesting. So now you have all these hits. You've got, you know, count me in, save your heart for me. Everybody loves a clown. She's just my style. Sure, gonna miss her. That was incredible. And then Green Grass. 
Yeah. So these hits are happening. And then that's when Kelton was in. But he, you got, then at that point, you got drafted? I got drafted after our seventh top ten in a row. Well, at the time, my first thing was, well, Elvis did it. I'll do it. And then I was thinking, well, I'll go away for two years, whatever. You know, I'll come back. I'll just pick it up. All of a sudden, these new people are showing up. Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, The Doors. And, you know, when I got out of the service, I said, now, now, wh wh what am I going to do here? I mean, I didn't want to just play their kind of music yeah. just to stay in it. Leon Russell told me one time, it can kill your career if you start playing out of your style. I, I totally agree with that. And, and I did not do it. I just bought a music store in 1972 in California, sold drums and guitars and gave lessons on both uh, up until 1984. When this agent called me and said, hey, Gary, the 60s are coming back. I said, who the hell is this? You know, and he says, no, really, they are. He says, I can book you 60 to 100 dates a year. And I said, if you can do it, I'll play them. And that's what's been happening since 84. So talk about that, that shop that you owned, because it was kind of like you were giving drum lessons and you had this music yeah. store. What was that like? What was that kind of, because you have to now understand a whole other business level of how to run a business. I was responsible as a musician, but now I had to be responsible in the business end of it too, you know? Interesting. So the business of being a musician in the band, were you a, a helping to run any of that? Were you organizing any of that? We, we did our, all of our hits all the time, but, mm. but the cover tunes that we were doing on a live show, we had to update those all the time. More rehearsals, stuff like that. I was responsible that way. But the business stuff was taken care of us by Snuffy Garrett and Liberty Records and our accountants. Actually, my mom's accountants because I was still a minor. You mm. know, so... But now, when I had the, the music store, I had to do it all. So now you're, you're running the store, you're, you're organizing things, you're ordering products from companies to have pro I mean, you're involved in the thick of what it is to run a retail outlet, which is no it, joke. You know, there were times when I was getting depressed about it. I, I, I was thinking, I, I'd much rather get out there and just play. The thing is, is that if I got out there and played, I, I would have to go from one show concerts to now in order to keep playing, do four sets a night at a club. Yeah. You know, that's the only way I could have kept playing. And I, I said, no, <laughs> no, I'm not going to do that. You know, uh, finish a song and you hear a smattering of this, <laughs> you know, now, if I, if I remember correctly, from what I read, there were a couple of times that you were in some of the movies with, with certain you know, roles playing in some of the movies that your, your dad had been involved with. Yeah, yeah. He gave me cameo parts, you know, quick little, maybe two, three minutes uh, yeah. in three different movies of his. It was so much fun because I, I felt like I was, I was uh, doing a movie with the king, <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, this was big deal for me. There was a, a movie called Rockabye Baby in 1958 where I played him as, as a kid singing a song to a little girl, Family Jewels. I think that was 1966 <laughs> where all these people got on a plane that my dad was piloting and they were saying, Captain, can you turn that music down? We can't hear ourselves talk. So he opened up the door, and here's me and the Playboys playing music in a little, <laughs> little toilet kind of place. <laughs> I know, it was great. You know. You know, at that time, there was a magic in the movie industry that time, and I'm sure the, uh, the amount of people that you were able to meet and oh, just yeah. the, the celebrities, I mean, this had to help shape you to be the outgoing showman that you really became. Well, you know, meeting all those people and being around Hollywood for as long as I was all my growing up life, it solidified how much I loved music. And my dad would have people over at the house, all comedians. At this time, you know, I'm just a teenager and I'm going, man, what a drag. <laughs> and I, I didn't like it. It all solidified my love for music. So were there any drummers or musicians 
during your formative years that you were leaning towards and listening to that that you felt really influenced you? Yeah, you know, my my dad and Dean had a great orchestra, you know. When when things were quiet, I would hang out with the band, you know, talking about chords and and the whatever and blah 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 and a great drummer Chiz Harris. Yeah. Did you know Chiz? Yes, absolutely, man. A phenomenal, phenomenal player. Yeah. I love to have, hang around with him. So I just loved the, all the musical part of everything that I, I saw and was part of as far as Hollywood and celebrities. Well, it really is interesting to see how your musical vibe kind of grew out of all that and the influences that you had and how you put that into your music. So now you put the band back together again and yeah. you're starting to travel nationally with the band. Gary Lewis and the Playboys is back in action. Right. And, and it was great, too. Well, that agent that called me was right. The 60s were coming back. Yeah. I, I thought he was just talking. Bah, 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 bah. You hear a lot of that, too. It was true. So I teamed up with Bobby V. Oh, and by the way, every time I saw Bobby V, I said, uh, this diamond ring, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and he, he just give me a look, you know. <laughs> yeah, that, that. <laughs> you know. <laughs> uh, so me and Bobby V, we, we started touring together in 85, and it, it was just great. I mean, that happened for maybe from 84 to like 2005. Around 2013, Gary Puckett, The Union Gap, Chuck Negron from Three Dog Night. You guys right. started getting together with Mark Lindsay, the, the former singer with Paul Revere and the Raiders, The yep. Turtles featuring Flo and Eddie. You're doing like tons of cities in Paradise Artists Happy Together Tour. This must have been huge. Oh, oh, it was huge. It was absolutely packed no matter where we played. 10,000 people packed. But I'll tell you, a tour like that is built for 25-year-olds, not 65-year-olds. You know, <laughs> I mean, it took its toll, boy. It really took its toll on us. I did it in 1985. And then I did it again in 2013 and 14. And after that, I said, that's it. You know, I mean, forget the bus and the sleepers and you get up and there's coffee and da, 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 da. you sleep all night and you say, how, how much longer till we get there? Seven more hours. <laughs> well, that's thrilling. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, if I was 25, great, you know. A, d a different time as, as age begins to let us know that uh, times have changed for sure. 2000, 2012, you released a single, You Can't Go Back. Right. Our bass player at the time, a guy named Nick Rather, he wrote it. He sent it to me and I listened to it. I said, yeah, let's re-record that, you know, and do that. And right from the very beginning, I said, no, nah, I, I don't want a record deal or anything like that. I said, let's just put it on iTunes because we're not trying to make tons of money. I just want to let our fans know that we're not dead. It's kind of interesting because that music from the 60s is, if anything, more alive now than ever. I mean, it really is still actively involved. And the people that were from that time have the money to spend and they want to hear the music that they grew up with. That's exactly right. And they want to hear it exactly like they remember it, too. Yeah, That's yeah. why there are no revisions on arrangements whatsoever mm. i just will not do it they want to hear it the way they remember it and they do and they all sing along with me don't mess with that stuff you know yeah that is memorabilia at its highest level we're playing out in las vegas at the golden nugget june 25th they are allowing 100 percent occupancy so i guess it's open up to that extent yeah because we always sell that place out it's great that's the fir first gig. How do you figure that this machine that you were a part of back in the 60s is still alive and well going strong? Incredible. Uh, you know, people will always like what they grew up with, yeah. you know. So not only are we playing to those people that we played to in the 60s, but they bring their kids and they're bringing their kids. We got we got teenagers you know, that, that are so happy to hear that kind of music. Can you believe it? On serious radio, you know, I hear bands that I've never heard of 
doing my songs. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You know, Gary, we have a, a, a large crowd that follows us in these interviews that we have on the Sessions panel on YouTube. And it's really exciting to have the stories and the inspiration of how it all began. So what I want to ask you in closing, what you would say to this young generation or what would you even have said to a young Gary Lewis to guide along the way to prepare for the challenges, to prepare for the hard times and to prepare for dealing with success, what kind of advice would you give them? I would only say that if it's in your mind, real, real strong, that you wanna be a musician and you wanna to try to get in the business and do whatever it takes to make it, don't let anybody talk you out of it. Boy, that is really great advice. I mean, that level of perseverance seems like that was really a part of your philosophy and how you lived your life. It was, it really was. Gary, what a pleasure to have some time with you, man. You've got so many great, great stories, and I'm sure there's probably a couple of books inside of you that probably need to be written to capture a lot of these stories and uh, and save them for future generations to have. But just having your time here right now will be great for everyone to listen and learn and enjoy a lot of the great memories that you are continuing to move forward. Thank you so much. Thank you, and thanks for having me. It was my pleasure. Now I'm Fabulara here at the Sessions panel. This is so exciting. Thanks for watching. Thanks for subscribing. Click the subscribe button to be a part of what we're doing. The views help us tremendously. All of your comments, we read them and react to them. This is incredible. The support you're giving us is great. The Sessions panel, we'll see you real soon.